<laughs> yeah, please. Okay. Um, all right. Today will be the um, last incarnation of these uh, uh, talks on Bayesian statistics. Uh, and I have like a half dozen topics I would love to cover. And uh, I'm sure we won't get to them all, but uh, I will uh, uh, try to move through them fairly briskly. Uh, I want to focus today on some of the problems, especially practical problems, I think, uh, and pitfalls and so on of, uh, you know, what people are actually doing these days uh, in physics and astrophysics and so on with, with the basic approach. Uh, I wanted to start by trying to clear up a little bit the uh, rather muddled presentation and confusing presentation that uh, I did last time on uh, uh, um, the Bayes factor, or the Bayes support, the Bayes evidence. Uh, I, I, I think I would like to claim that this is a good example of uh, how subtle and confusing these matters can be. I understood it at the beginning uh, of the lecture, and by the end of the lecture, I didn't just didn't understand anymore. And uh, uh, since then, I have uh, tried to clarify things. So, um, I I wrote down, uh, of course. Uh, Bayes' equation at the top, just to save us time, uh, since I always end up writing it down so much. Uh, but what I really want to emphasize, uh, talk about first is this uh, Bayes factor. And uh, at some point during the last lecture, we started saying that it was the ratio of this term uh, in the two, two different hypotheses. That's wrong. It's not the ratio of that term. That term's the same. Uh, no matter what the hypothesis is. Uh, an important thing to understand about the Bayes factor is it's a slightly different, has a slightly different goal than just a purely Bayesian uh, analysis of a model. Uh, it's a, in particular supposed to be a way of comparing two hypotheses and deciding uh, which one you should prefer. And it's in a sense uh, the, the most closely related uh, concept in um, Classical statistics is uh, null hypothesis testing, trying to reject uh, a null hypothesis to allow you to uh, accept some specific hypothesis, for example. Uh, so I, I've, one of the things that got us confused last time is I was writing models as m sub 1 and m sub 2 and everything. Uh, let me just change the notation and call the two hypotheses, which you can think of as two different models, h1 and h2. 
So the Bayes factor is uh, defined as the ratio of the likelihood term, this term, not that term, uh, in the two different uh, hypothetical models. And if the models have parameters, uh, this is uh, how you uh, evaluate uh, the numerator and denominator just by integrating uh, out uh, the uh, distribution of, of parameters. These are the thetas or the phi's. I've used different symbols. Often this is written with the same symbol, but there's no reason the two hypotheses should have the same uh, uh, same set of parameters. Uh, and the pi here, uh, again, I've changed notation a little. I've been writing those as p's. Pi's are priors on the parameters, not priors on the hypotheses. So uh, this is the probability, given that H, your hypothesis is true, that you have a certain value of the uh, for one of the parameters, theta sub i, and you have to uh, integrate over all the uh, theta sub i. So you need a prior for each different uh, hypothesis, I mean, each different parameter um, uh, in each of the two hypotheses to uh, evaluate this term. And so this is just the probability that you get the data you have observed under one hypothesis and another. Uh, it may be helpful to think about uh, uh, a specific example of that. Uh, suppose I have x-ray observations of a cluster of galaxies, and I want to compare the hypothesis of a isothermal model, the gas all has the same temperature uh, uh, throughout the cluster, uh, to some sort of, say, adiabatic model where uh, there's not been much energy change per unit volume in the gas, or, say, to a model uh, a kind of crazy flexible model. Suppose I just took some, I pixelated the volume of the cluster and I allowed my model to assign a different temperature and a different density to the gas. Those would be the two parameters that determine the X-ray emission. We'll assume the composition space. So let's imagine that I just uh, let myself assign to each volume of gas or each cell inside the cluster its own temperature and density. So that's a model with a lot of parameters, uh, but a lot of flexibility, and so on. doesn't necessarily have to make physical sense. Um, then uh, for both of those uh, types of models, I can uh, calculate the um, chance that I get the data that I've observed and evaluate uh, the, the Bayesian evidence for them. You note the nice feature that um, if I this model, suppose hypothesis two with this uh, very flexible model of the cluster where each volume of gas in the cluster gets to have its own uh, temperature and its own density, then I'm that integral on the bottom is going to get big because I'm integrating over lots of parameters uh, and, and over some extensive range of possible temperatures and densities, or at least possibly so. And uh, so that'll make the tend to make the Bayes ratio. Uh, small, that's the automatic penalty or the automatic Occam's razor. We discussed the automatic penalty for overfitting, whereas let's say the isothermal model uh, just has some uh, temperature profile and some, uh, I mean, some temperature, such as isothermal, and some density profile, which maybe just has one parameter, like a, uh, a slope, or I guess we need a central density too. Or uh, so it's some small number of parameters. So the Bayes factor is in fact the uh, probability that the hypothesis one is true given the data compared to the uh, probability that hypothesis two is true given the data. Uh, only by, if, if by multiplying the Bayes factor with your priors on the two hypotheses. Um, and this leads us to the um, point that I was trying to make last time, is a very widespread confusion in the, in the use of uh, the Bayes factor is to say if the Bayes factor is large, that that is, determines that hypothesis one is two, a true, or the correct hypothesis, or it would be the way to bet that sort of uh, statement you see a lot of times. It is, however, as I said before I got confused last time, actually the change in the evidence for hypothesis one relative to hypothesis two 
uh, not the actual uh, evidence uh, or total evidence. So you have to put the priors in there. Um, and there is a great deal uh, of confusion about, about this. Uh, people don't like setting priors. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, just concentrating on the base factor and ignoring this term is popular. Uh, however, you should keep in mind that even in the base factor, you have priors, you have these, this pi, and you may have a lot of them. And those are actually often quite badly done if you actually look into published base factor uh, analyses, is the priors on the parameters are often taken uh, to be something very simple, like uniform, and you know, not a lot of thought or care is necessarily put into them. And they can have a big effect on the answer. And it's sort of hidden from you after you've integrated every, everything out. Uh, if you're going to do a Bayes factor analysis, you should probably study the sensitivity of the result uh, to your priors on those parameters. Uh, so the uh, example, one of, one of our favorite examples is this uh, medical test, which is 99% of the time right, and you apply uh, to a population where the disease is, is very rare. So the probability of the data positive, that the test is positive, if the patient is sick, is 0.99. And the probability of a positive result if the patient is well is 0.01. So this ratio, the base factor here, is 99. That is uh, in the standard Jeffries uh, classification of, of base factors said to be decisive evidence, actually 100 said to be decisive evidence. So this is it's very slightly less than decisive. However, uh, as we discussed before, if if this ratio, which is the incidence of the disease in the population, a prior probability that I'm sick, or when the patient is sick over the patient being well, is any number you like, let's say 10 to the minus four, then this number over here, of course, it turns out to be about uh, 10 to the minus 2. So you can have decisive evidence for a conclusion uh, which has only one chance in 100 of being correct. The Bayes factor alone is not uh, a strong reason or not a reason to prefer one hypothesis. So what is its value? Uh, well, one thing the Bayes factor is very good for is uh, what you might call data quality or relevance on uh, metric. If I have a large base factor and I'm the experimentalist, I've taken the data, designed the instrument, uh, developed the medical test for the disease, you know, I can be proud. That's good. If that's 99, that means that this data. This test, this, uh, this data is very discriminatory. So if you're evaluating how worthwhile your data is, if you want a large beta, in other words, whoever, you know, whatever doctor or researcher developed this test can be proud of that 99. And if it were a thousand, if it was only one time in a thousand wrong, they could be prouder still. If it was unity, if you were equally likely to get a positive result if you were sick or well, it would be totally useless. You know, that would then you know that wouldn't tell you anything. And the probability after you apply the test would be the same as the probability before you applied it. Uh, it would just be uh, flipping a coin, basically, and that would be telling you nothing. So so one thing the Bayes factor is definitely good for is measuring how useful your data is in addressing this problem. Uh, what else could we say? Well, um, one thing we can say is if beta is big, but this is small, that has to mean that uh, something unusual has happened. 
That shouldn't happen very often. So in any one case, you're just stuck with this. But suppose we have the situation that beta is much greater than one, but probability of the hypothesis one given the data. Uh, is much less than one, well, it's just multiplication. That means this is a small factor. And so how that means that is not something that should happen very often. You should be sort of surprised uh, if I come in and you just give one patient the test and uh, uh, it turns out to be positive. Even that it turned out to be positive, you're not surprised that they're well, but you're surprised that you got a positive result because almost all of your results should have been negative. If you're, uh, so, so if you're in a situation where you're getting large Bs, uh, large base factors, large supports, but the hypothesis is proving, one, is proving false most of the time, what that tells you uh, uh, is either that something very unusual is happening, or that your priors are wrong. It can be a hint that the prior is wrong. Uh, and it means you should probably look at the prior. Like, uh, if it uh, uh, turns out that uh, you see this a lot, uh, it may mean that the false positive rate is much li larger than you thought it was, some sort of thing. Uh, so it's a hint that something's wrong uh, if, if that occurs. And another way of saying that is a lot of the times you can kind of trust the Bayes ratio if you get evidence that's very strong in favor of the Bayes ratio. Um, the, um, you know, if the Bayes factor is large, uh, and routinely, you know, you get a lot, of, if you get a large Bayes factor uh, and are led and trust it and start making your calls that way and turn out being wrong a lot. Uh, you know that tells you uh, that's that tells you something. Um, so, so sorry. So in the case of this adiabatic versus isothermal case, right? So how do we assign the priors then for these two different hypotheses? I mean, these are completely different models. Right. So because well, that's it's, so is this some? I mean, uh, there's. Yeah. The, I mean, it's what the ba using the Bayesian formulism if you're face to face with is that maybe is that there's no good way to do that. That doesn't mean that the Bayesian method's wrong. No, no, no. It no, just means not. you're in trouble. But you know, what would typically be done in a published paper is they would say, well, for the isothermal model, I know clusters of galaxies from others I've studied have temperatures of order 100 million degrees. So let me just say the temperature distribution is uniform between, you know, 30 million, 300 million degrees, or something like that. And I know density profiles are often, you know, something or, you know, in some range of indices, and I just put in some numbers for that. And, and then maybe when I do the bottom one, that's more difficult, but I again just give myself some wide range uh, and, and go over it. And it may very well be, you know, lead to a misleading result uh, if you don't pick those properly. But Pretending you, you know, pretending you don't have to pick those priors, or that, or that they don't matter, is. But, but that's the pi thing pi. that you're talking about, not p of h one by p of h two. Right. There may be no. But you need to assign that as well, right? As you're saying. Well, if you if you want this, you have to assign that, and there's. You know, like if you studied a lot of other clusters and found most of them are isothermal or something with better data, then you might have a good idea of how to assign that. Um, otherwise, it's one of, going to be one of these subjective priors. The nice thing about this is that it will penalize you for trying to use a model with so many parameters. That happens with the pot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the reason people often avoid Bayesian statistics, and I'll show you some, the rest of this lecture will show you some more, is it's awful. You have to do a lot of awful approximations and guesses and um, uh, some awful computations that are not very reliable. I, mean, I want to hope 
to talk about MC. MC a little bit, all of its pitfalls and so on. Um, but you know, doing it the other way is not a better way. It's just an easier way. Um, in fact, maybe this is an opportune moment to mention uh, a paper that Alexi wanted me to uh, ask me to say a little bit about, which is um, there has recently been uh, some uh, a couple of papers that was an article in Nature and so on. I can send the references to people who wanted uh, authors' names. It's Johnson. I think it's Johnson or Jensen. Um, Um, in which they use the Bayes factor, uh, which is the frequentist part of the Bayes equation. That's what Bayes, that's what frequentists uh, uh, calculate usually, uh, is the probability that of the uh, data given a model or given a hypothesis, uh, and just look at that distribution. Uh, there, is, uh, Johnson is a statistician who developed a way of uh, figuring out what range of Bayes factors be uh, mapped on to standard frequentist uh, uh, null hypothesis tests. And it turns out that the, uh, uh, as he showed by analyzing a bunch of papers out of the literature, that a typical uh, rejection of the 90, uh, null hypothesis at 95% uh, percent, uh, uh, prob probability or confidence by most frequentist tests correspond to Bayes factors, sort of three to five range, quite weak Bayes factors, uh, and uh, showed that for uh, reasonable uh, priors imposed on uh, uh, most of the, uh, on the tests and the literature, that uh, in fact, uh, you know, this probability was nothing like 0.05, it was much larger. Uh, and his recommendation, which was odd, I thought, not, was not to do it correctly with uh, a full Bayesian analysis, but to adopt a much more stringent uh, uh, rejection of the null hypothesis probability. If you're going to use frequentist tests, he thought uh, something between 5 times 10 to the minus 3 and just 10 to the minus 3 uh, uh, probability of the null hypothesis would be a lot safer. Uh, it turns out in, in many of the social sciences and so on, uh, and uh, uh, even in uh, some physical sciences and so on, there's a sort of crisis of non-reproducibility. There's even a web page of retraction of results and uh, showing that, like in some of the standard journals that publish, where the standard for pub uh, publication is 95% confidence, a large fraction of those are turning out to be non-reproducible. Uh, it, according to Johnson, is uh, for a variety of reasons, but one of them is is that uh, uh, not taking into account the priors and treating uh, just the likelihood term. Yes. So, was the recommendation was <coughs> three sigma or four sigma? Well, he the like more three sigma. The the he didn't phrase it in terms of sigma, but the standard very well established is that the probability of the null hypothesis should be less than 0.05. Uh, so that's 95. He's, he suggested replacing this with something in the range, that range. Uh, and he showed this requires, this is essentially uh, quite impractical or expensive at least because it would require much larger samples, for example. Uh, data in many of the studies have been done. But uh, uh, he essentially claims that this would give you Bayes factors that are more like in the very strong evidence range. Yes. It just be for a specific set of studies. It doesn't mean that you should do this for some. Right? Yeah, it does depend on the priors, but uh, and he, he looked at his. You know, some sample of uh, unreproduced results out of the literature, uh, and tried to assess, as far as I could tell, uh, you know, what reasonable priors might have been on those. But to a considerable extent, just misled by the jargon, I think uh, people uh, 
are either just using frequentist tests or if they calculate this, uh, they ignore the priors, which is like saying either, prior, either hypothesis is equally likely. It's like setting that first term to, I mean, setting the second term to one. Uh, in, in his um, his study, so you, the, the benchmark is ninety five percent confidence. So that means that we would expect at least five percent of papers in the journal to sort of keep sitting like results to be then annoyed that you see it. Right. Um, since so many papers are published, that could actually be a very large number. Did but it's a much larger a fraction of the number of published. I don't know the fraction is, but there's been a lot of discussion in the literature, and it's much larger than 5%. It's like half. Because there's also an incentive or a disincentive to public in missing results, too. So if you have a bunch of the same results just sitting in someone's desk and you're going any further, you can kind of see how this. Yeah, there's a number of other number of other effects that can cause this, like the, the publication bias and just doing sloppy statistics. And, um, Poor, in, poor experiment design. And, I mean, there's a whole host of, uh, if you look into there's this has actually become a field almost of its own, studying the causes of, of irreproducible statistical results, and there's a variety of things, but he tried to address just this, this one part. Maybe uh, let me move on a little, unless, uh, whoa. Um, all right, well, maybe I don't need to spend too much time on this, but we've talked repeatedly uh, about this uh, example of, of stellar photometry, where I have two apertures, one with a star, one without a star in the sky, and I subtract them off, and how I need to take into account the prior distribution on the brightness of stars, and so on. You've all heard that. This is, uh, although a very simple example, uh, uh, a very idealized one. For one thing, I've assumed you know where the star is. It's pretty unusual that we have a star uh, which we know zero about uh, information about how bright it is, but we know precisely where it is. So if I really wanted to do this problem right, I wouldn't be just uh, fitting for a star, which is maybe what I'm actually interested in. I might be uh, fitting for x and y, the position of the star inside uh, I also might want to take into account atmospheric extinction uh, uh, effects, so I need to know where in the sky I'm, uh, I'm pointing, uh, uh, which uh, includes the celestial coordinates alpha and delta, but also the uh, coordinates in the telescope frame, theta and phi. I have additional data on these from the actual, you know, from the engineering data from the telescope that points at those. Uh, I would like to know the point spread function of the star because it uh, has um, light outside. How much light outside the aperture, of course, depends on where it is in the aperture if I'm not centered. So I uh, also want uh, uh, some sort of um, point spread function uh, parameters, which typically would be a handful, there might be a central Gaussian, uh, wings on the point spread functions, amplitudes and those two things. Uh, if I'm doing a series of integrations, those could be a function of time. Uh, this point spread function is not necessarily symmetric, uh, so I may want uh, uh, parameters to describe the image structure. Uh, maybe there are diffraction spikes, or there will be diffraction, uh, maybe there will be diffraction. Uh, effects, uh, and so on. Uh, a whole set of, uh, now of course I have some information on those if I'm not just measuring counts, but if I have uh, uh, what to call these variables, you know, some parameters here, uh, and so on. I can have atmospheric uh, parameters changing, the optical depth of the atmosphere, uh, the performance of the amplifiers and so on can be changing as a function of time. If I really want to push uh, this um, uh, to get the ultimate out of this data, to get the most precise possible uh, measurement of the uh, brightness of the star, 
I really need a model that has all of these parameters in it. And, um, uh, and a bunch of other data, not just the counts from the uh, photomultiplier. Now, from the point of view of a mathematician, so what? That's just as easy as the, the basic problem. We just plug all, you know, we just add a few uh, more types of data to the data and a few <laughs> more bells and whistles to the, uh, uh, to the model, to model the atmosphere, to model the point spread function, to model the tracking of the telescope, uh, and so on. Um, and, um, and chug away with Bayes' theorem. And then I can uh, calculate uh, some posterior that will be some distribution in all of those parameters, just one of which is what I actually want to know, the brightness of the star. Uh, I can marginalize, you know, so after I have all of that, uh, let's say, so I have the, the brightness of the star uh, as a function of all these other parameters, uh, its probability, so I can marginalize out the brightness of the star. Remember, marginalizing out things requires sitting a prior on each one of those <coughs> parameters, so I have to have a prior on each one of them. By the way, that's a big problem with marginalization, is after you've marginalized, you, the dependence on the priors is sort of vanishes the priors on the things you've marginalized out, but they can be very important. Uh, and this is a, you know, if you're reading the literature or doing your own analyses and stuff and doing marginalization, uh, People feel very comfortable marginalizing things out, but a lot of times you, uh, that will have a big effect on the priors on the parameters that you're throwing away, and have a big effect on the parameter you're caring about, and it sort of disappears into the analysis so much. That I'm going a little fast here because I'm going to go into other things, but if what I'm saying isn't clear, please stop me and uh, ask the question. Um, so. A very simple measurement like that, done uh, in a way that would satisfy a, a, a Bayesian statistician, uh, turns into a real mess. And you know, uh, setting up the prior on the distribution of brightnesses of stars is is only where your trouble starts, so to speak. Um, the uh, you have all these priors to set on, you know, things like jitter and the telescope tracking. Uh, the point spread function and how it changes with time and the atmosphere and a bunch of things that are, you know, well, a lot of work to estimate well and maybe impossible in some cases. Um, and worse still, um, imagine a case of not measuring the brightness of one star, which is easy enough, but uh, in principle. But let's suppose we want to extract uh, cosmological parameters from a uh, microwave background observations, or we want to uh, extract, um, you know, cosmological information on W from, from weak lensing models, where we uh, care about a, a huge number of things. Models very quickly run into having hundreds of parameters, and each of which needs uh, priors uh, assigned to them, and uh, all of which, you know, almost all of which have to be marginalized out if we're, you know, measuring micro taking microwave background data, we're fitting foregrounds and backgrounds to, well, not backgrounds, foregrounds to the data, uh, and uh, as well as all of these other things that you have to take out. So uh, there's a couple of kinds of problems with that. One is doing it right. Uh, but the second is actually doing the calculation. Suppose I want, you know, the expectation value of the marginalized distribution on uh, some of the cosmological parameters. I'm particularly interested in whether there were gravity waves or not. So I you don't know whether to call Alan Guth and Andre Linde and write them up and so on. So uh, the, um, you end up having to do very, uh, a very complex analysis. And uh, worse still, uh, we of course can't do uh, such uh, big multi-dimensional integrations, brute force. It just quickly exceeds the, even the greatest computational power we can imagine having. If I have a hundred parameters and I want to sample them reasonably finely, you know, I can end up with 
you know, if I just wanted to do a sort of brute force integration to, and there's a bunch of integrals that will come into these, um, the marginalization integrals, the integrals to calculate the likelihoods and the Bayes factor and so on, the contract to decide between models. Uh, you know, I'm talking about tens of hundreds of, of uh, uh, calculations, which uh, we see the power of any conceivable computer in the uh, age of the universe. And so we have writing to the rescue. This acronym that you hear almost as frequently as NASA, these that has the acronym NASA. Um, these days, uh, MCMC. MCMC uh, is, uh, I think many people have the impression MCMC uh, algorithms uh, uh, are a part of Bayesian statistics. They're not. Uh, they have nothing particular to do with Bayesian statistics. They're just an algorithm for doing uh, multi multi-dimensional uh, uh, numerical integrations that were invented for other things, and those come up a lot in Bayesian statistics. So MCMC techniques uh, have been a, a, a huge, uh, essentially they have made uh, uh, modern Bayesian statistical analysis possible because they have made doing these numerical integrations possible. Um, Winston Churchill said, democracy is a terrible form of government. It's just better than all the others. That's not quite as well as he phrased it. Uh, MCMC is an incredibly bad way of doing multi-dimensional integrations. It's horrible, fails, and is misleading routinely. Um, um, but it's better than any other technique we have. In fact, for most purposes, it's the only technique we have. Uh, but uh, since since uh, uh, Thomas Bayes was a reverend, the Reverend Bayes is perhaps uh, reasonable that uh, I discuss things as though I were giving a sermon, and the, 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 the moral of the sermon uh, today, in a sense, or this part of it, is don't just grab MCMC packages out of, uh, you know, and there's a bunch of them floating around, and throw your problem into them and sit back and believe the answer that comes out. Um, it's uh, as bad or worse uh, than the old practice of using chi-squared all the time. Um, and without thinking about whether it was a, a biased or a biased estimator. Chi-squared, as we've already discussed uh, in one of the earlier lectures, is a biased estimator of nearly everything it's used to estimate in the literature of these days. Uh, and just plugging in MCMC without understanding MCMC is, uh, or the details of the calculation you're doing uh, is um, uh, no better. You know, it's equally hazardous as just doing that kind of, well, maybe more hazardous, I guess, than doing uh, chi squared. But it's more likely to produce something that's wrong and you're not be able to tell that it's wrong. So uh, you should enter the MCMC arena with, a, with a fear and quaking and misgivings and, uh, and a great sense of paranoia about things uh, that can go wrong. Uh, a number of years, uh, Takata-san and I, uh, organized a uh, statistics workshop that was held here, and uh, Professor Ming, who's the head of the statistics department at Harvard, gave a wonderful lecture on all of the uh, things that can go wrong in MCMC uh, integrations. Do we still have his slides somewhere on my? I think so. That might be able to iPad. Might be fun to look at or to have him back sometime to get this if you're doing a lot of MCMC. Uh, but let me say a few words about, about some of the things uh, that can go wrong. Um, well, the, does everyone know what MCMC is? Anyone not know that's brave enough to reveal it? Um, all right, well, I won't uh, waste or spend time uh, 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 describing it, but it's a basically uh, a way of random walking through a, um, a uh, multi-dimensional integral and ev evaluating the integrand at points uh, and adding them up, of course, uh, in a, a way that uh, 
after enough steps, converges to the correct, correct answer. And it does that without doing nearly as many samples as it would take to do the brute force thing where you have to look at 10 to the 300 different uh, values of the, of the integrand. Uh, and there's a variety of uh, algorithms in the literature for how to make that uh, random walk uh, through the space of parameters that has the, is guaranteed to converge to the uh, correct answer uh, uh, or to, to ergodically approach the, uh, the correct uh, sampling of the space to give the correct integrand. Um, so that's very happy, and all of those algorithms are mathematically guaranteed to give you the right answer uh, if you integrate for enough steps. But the single biggest problem with NC is, is convergence. And uh, tests for convergence. So the question is, how do you know how many steps, random steps in this random walk you need to take uh, before you've got the answer you want? And uh, the answer is there's no good way to know. There's no reliable single way to know. There is a mathematical theorem uh, that will guarantee that for at least some uh, multi-dimensional spaces will give you an upper bound on that number, but uh, the upper bound uh, is not a generally a useful one, like if you really need 100,000 steps, it may tell you 10 to the 100th is the upper bound. Uh, 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 a better, uh, it's been an active area of research in Bayesian statistics to try to make a, uh, uh, a better uh, bound on the number of steps to convert uh, the, the Rosenthal, I think, uh, test is the state of the art, and it was suggested about 15 years ago, and it's is the one that likes to give you numbers that are you know, uh, impractically large. So uh, that doesn't work. What people do in practice is to um, um, look at the answer and wait for it to stop changing very much. So when you first start making uh, a random walk uh, and you say, what, what's the answer I've gotten so far, it'll be jumping all over the place. But if you uh, wait for a while, it will typically settle down. So, so here's the number of steps. There's the integral. So it'll be, you know, all over the place. Uh, and so you say, uh -huh. looks converged, uh, stop, write the paper. The problem is that uh, in many cases, this will later blow up again, somewhere over here, settle down somewhere else. Uh, and it may do that more than once. Uh, to see why that happens in a simple one-dimensional case, you should think about you're trying to integrate under a function that maybe looks a bit like this. Uh, and you start it somewhere, you start at some point here, and uh, your little random walk thing, which uh, is most of these random, the, the sampling uh, methodologies like high values where the integrand is high, so it'll move over here, but they also have a randomness, so they kind of dance around and don't miss the areas where it's low. Um, and uh, so they may get the integral in this area pretty well, but it will take them a long time until they find this, especially if you're using uh, something that steps with a random, you know, the, the random walk has random elements in it, so it's the distance you step varies. And in typical ones, you use something like a Gaussian. So like getting over here could be a 15 or 100 sigma or whatever to find this part of this contribution. Now this is not a very well-behaved function. 
uh, drawn in one dimension, you might say, well, my, you know, my integrand is not that crazy. Okay, probably not. But in multi-dimensions, that's not so unlikely that there's uh, additional repeats. Uh, depending on exactly which integral you're doing, those can be uh, separate solutions. You know, they can be degenerate parameters. A lot of times your parameters are degenerate, and there can be a peak around one set of parameters that fits the data, and a peak around another set of parameters, you know, which are where you've traded off, you know, a bad value of one thing with a better value of another thing, which is like a separate model. So a typical example of that is fitting uh, radial velocity curves for exoplanets with the orbital elements of n planets. If you have multiple planets uh, and you're fitting for the period of the planet, the mass of the planet, and the eccentricity of the orbit, uh, and you just have velocity data, and you don't know how many planets there are either. So the n the number of planets is a discrete variable. And there's often degenerate solutions. So you can explain the data quite well with you know, this set of planets and eccentricities and masses, or this other one. The, the periods come out pretty well, actually, but uh, are pretty independent of the other parameters, but a lot of other things. And oh, also, in a, if you have an eccentric orbit, there's also the question of viewing angles, so you have some additional parameters there. In a space like that, there could be very well separated uh, uh, multiple uh, things and multiple uh, solutions on each peaks. Uh, another uh, place type of distribution that it tends to have trouble with is one that looks like this, that has one nice peak, but is flat for a long way out here, where this area is significant, or maybe even greater than the area in the peak. And if you want to evaluate the integral under this function, you have to sample these places that the, um, uh, that the random walk doesn't particularly like. Now, um, when you choose your MCMC algorithm, you get to choose uh, a bunch of soft, so there's yet more freedom involved. You can choose what sort of sampler you like. You can choose the distribution of steps it makes, or what's usually called step proposals. Uh, you can make those asymmetric. Uh, you can uh, make steps from your current position uh, in sort of a random direction through the space or you, and evaluate that, or you can uh, consider steps in each of the dimensions of the space separately and uh, accept and reject those steps uh, uh, separately. That's called uh, algorithms along that direction are called Gibbs samplers. Uh, you can, uh, this function that, um, the definition of a Markov chain, by the way, is that uh, uh, something that makes a change in a variable that depends only on the variable's previous chain value. So it, in moving through this space, uh, the, what makes it a Markov chain is the fact that our next place we're going to sample depends only on where we are now, not on the history of where we've been before. Uh, and Monte Carlo just means that it's a random, that there's some random factors in that. Uh, so in MCMC there are uh, a host of uh, problems with convergence. The general advice of mathematicians, again being practical, is run it until you're sure it's converged. Then run it more, a lot more, until you're really sure, and then keep running it. And when you submit it to the journal, keep running the Markov chain until you get the referees report back. <laughs> don't ever stop, basically. Uh, moreover, don't do it just once. Do it with different samplers, with uh, different uh, proposal functions, which tells you about how far you want to step, and do an elaborate sensitivity study of the result. And by the way, you may have to do this several several Markov MCMC analyses in, your, you know, in the process of doing your analysis of a real set of data. You know, there's the marginalization one, there's the Bayes factor one, there's a variety of things that you may have to do. Uh, beat it to death. Um, and make sure that you're not too sensitive to, uh, that you haven't uh, stopped in a calculating before you've converged and that the answer doesn't depend on the width of the proposal function, the shape of the proposal function, the type of sampler you're using. Uh, that's a sort of practical uh, working uh, 
astronomer or physicist approach, uh, uh, another mathematical approach, is to really understand the structure of your multidimensional space very well. Uh, and then you can figure out what's a good sample to use on it. Um, you know, if you know what its asymmetries and properties are. For real physics experiments with all of these models and parameters and so on that we've discussed, that's usually pretty hard to do. But uh, um, so, so this is quite uh, uh, quite a mess. And you should also uh, worry about the priors you've put in. One of uh, Professor Ning's little examples is small changes in the integrand in the thing you're evaluating, which you could say come from changing the prior on one of the model parameters that you're using, uh, can change the convergence by many orders of magnitude and so on. So uh, you have to do these uh, multi-dimensional integrals. MC, MC is the best way and usually the only way we have to do it. And it's very um, tricky and fragile and often misleading and so on. So uh, words of warning. Uh, there's also problems, I don't think I have time to go into them all. Uh, it's been discovered that, that you actually get better convergence, quicker convergence, if you throw out some of the initial uh, random walks until it settles in. This is called the burn-in period. And of course you want to start a few different, or many, maybe many different seeds from many different starting locations, but you can pick some number of initial steps that you disregard and you'll get rather faster convergence because some of these fluctuations make very big contributions that aren't necessarily meaningful. The canonical number is to throw out the first thousand steps. Uh, that's a complete whistling in the dark guess at, the, at what you should do, but uh, uh, you may, may be better is to look at this fluctuation and look for it to settle down. So there's a variety of things you, you know, it's very far from, you know, a unique uh, thing, way to proceed or, uh, you know, just a standard thing to do. There's a lot going on there that you have to mess with. Now, one, uh, an additional warning, have, have you decided to take up other careers <laughs> uh, Let me, by the way, uh, people who are experts in big data or uh, analyses and pulling a small number, a small number of interesting numbers out of Huge data sets are really hot on the uh, job market right now. So, uh, in industry, I mean, for other things, you know, you can have a starting salary that would endow a professorship after the first year. Um, the next uh, and probably last little. Uh, Warning I want to give you is MCMC depends in many different ways on generating random, using random numbers. So you use a random number generator in the proposal algorithm that proposes the next, next position in the multi parameter space, depending on this one. Uh, you then look at the value of the integrand at the current location and the proposed location and uh, accept or reject making that step uh, in a probabilistic way depends on the random numbers. Uh, you often uh, uh, start your position, your, your movements through the space based on random numbers and so on. It uses lots of random numbers. How do you get a random number out of a computer? Uh, what do you usually do? Probably the best thing is throw the computer in the air and see where it lands, <laughs> right side up or upside down a few times, uh, and generate, generate a binary number. Of course, we, as you all know, we we have you can't computer the deterministic. There's no such thing as a random number coming out of the computer. No random number generator, uh, essentially by construction, satisfies the best available um, uh, mathematical definition of randomness. Uh, by the way, there is no single generally accepted uh, definition of what it means for a sequence of numbers to be random. But the, the best one is that there's no shorter sequence of numbers that contains all, all of the information you know, from which you could generate all of the information in 
the full sequence. Um, it's a sort of information theory based one. Uh, seems like the best. And random number generators, of course, grossly violate that because the program <laughs> itself, the code itself, is a sequence of numbers that generates all of the others. Um, now, are the numbers that computers, the pseudo-random numbers, so what we actually use are called pseudo-random numbers, uh, are they good enough for an MCMC -MC calculation? Uh, that would be, it would be very interesting to see that investigated. Let me quickly tell you, you know, figures of merit for random number generators usually Returning values on the interval of zero to one, you know, that they be uniformly distributed between zero and one, and the ith one it generates versus the i minus one it generates has a zero correlation. So if I get a big number, there's no tendency for the next number to be big or little or in the middle or anything else, so this should be a uniform distribution. Many of the random number generators that use computers do nothing more than those two. Uh, what's the chance that they suppose I take x to the i squared minus x to the i minus seven cubed over x to the i minus 3 squared plus, you well, get the idea, x to the i minus 52 uh, squared. Square root. Is that function going to be distributed as though those x's were random and independent? Who the hell knows? Uh, very possibly not. Do we care? Who knows uh, for a particular random one? But just to tell you one little story, some of you may have heard it. It's sort of uh, in the very early days of in-body calculations, Ferrar, Seth, Rich, Gott, and I were doing uh, some of the, the very first cosmological in-body calculations. I think we had the second uh, second publication and the first movie on the market uh, of, of published data. And so, uh, at that time, we could only afford to integrate a thousand points. Believe it or not, this took the largest. Uh, uh, amount of time ever granted on a machine, uh, a big computing facility in the UK at the time, uh, to do uh, that for a few billion years. At uh, which point, it was supposed to be a galaxy. Uh, so we wanted them uniform in the sphere. So we laid down, uh, we just used a random number generator and in a such children that we were. And, you know, we just picked x, y, z, uh, cut off. Uh, everything that was in the corners of the, and so we had a ra random distribution of points in the unit sphere that we just threw out things that were further than uh, uh, one from the, uh, from the origin. Uh, and that was our starting conditions for Poisson initial conditions, which uh, we thought would, would be interesting ones. And we burned this huge amount of uh, computing time in it, on it, and uh, we then had a nicely clumped distribution that was uh, not so bad, and had even been about the right two point correlation. Unbelievably obscure format. Uh, and shipping it to some facility in Britain where they had a video camera and an, an oscilloscope display, you know, uh, uh, and then would read one frame off the tape and put points of light on the screen and uh, take a frame of the movie and then advance it and take a frame. It cost a lot of money, uh, thousands of dollars in those days. And it was on uh, you know, film, so when the projector tore it up, it was gone. Um, I've since had it digitized. If somebody wants to see it, I think I can actually show you. It was like a Charlie Chaplin movie. But anyway, um, uh, but we, you know, we were very happy. We could see our, our the endpoints of our simulation in 3D. And then for some reason, I don't even know why, we decided to look uh, at the initial conditions in 3D. Now we'd already looked at them 
in 2D, we plotted X, Y, Y, Z, and X, Z, and they look like nice circles with uniform points. As we rotated the point of view around this, you know, what we thought was a sphere filled uniformly uh, with points, it started looking funky. And eventually, we saw that the points were actually on 11 exactly defined to the precision of the uh, calculator, 11 parallel planes. So we had 11 planes of points sliced through our sphere. I believe it was 11 in some uh, prime number, but who knows why it was that. Uh, and, uh, you know, tipped at some funny angle to the axes. That's why it wasn't obvious when we did X, Y. So picking triples of points out of that particular uh, in-body simulator uh, was, uh, or in pseudo-random number generator, was for some reason or another giving triples of points uh, in uh, on 11 parallel planes. Um, these, uh, pretty much for sure, any pseudo-random number generator has some sort of structure uh, at some level. It's basically a can't avoid it. Uh, it could be something, uh, there's certainly ways of you know, getting rid of the 11 planes, which we quickly did. Uh, we actually managed to, well, never mind. But um, the, um, so, one thing I think I'm always worried about, uh, and I don't think people are aware enough of and pay enough attention to, not only in uh, MCMC, but in any Monte Carlo calculation, uh, just about that we do, is whether the randomness of the pseudo-random numbers is sufficient to the type of randomness you need. Uh, and here, once more, my only practical advice uh, for running an MCMC uh, is to compare different random number generators and see um, uh, how similar or different the, uh, the answers that they give you are. Um, you know, they, it doesn't, wouldn't tell you which one was right. It doesn't, uh, but if, if they don't, you know, it's not likely they would all make the same mistake. So if they all give you the same answer, with quite different uh, random number of generator angles. By the way, the, the numerical community is aware of this problem. And quite a lot of work has been done since the mid 1970s when that problem I just described arose. Uh, and you know, now if you look at numerical recipes or various packages, you'll see much better random number generators than we used to have. But are they good enough to give you a really random walk through a hundred dimensional space? I would be hard to say. That probably depends on the structure of the space and what they have other side, uh, and the type of sample you're using. So you should probably also uh, evaluate your sensitivity to random number generators. Um, all right, I'll, I'll stop. Let me just say as a final um, comment uh, that if you look at the kind of experiments we do these days where uh, you know, we use facilities that cost hundreds of millions of dollars or more, you know, huge telescopes, you know, instrumentation that costs many tens of millions of dollars, uh, you know, representing a very large number of you know, FTE years of, of people's time and effort going into it and careers and so on uh, to produce these incredibly uh, powerful and big data sets that we get these days. Maybe we shouldn't be that surprised that the work required to get the science out of that data is also a really huge undertaking to really confidently get answers uh, to simple questions out of big data. This probably requires an order, of, you know, an effort which is not of an entirely different order of magnitude than producing the instruments and taking the data, you know, designing the experiment and all of that. It's uh, to really do uh, an MCMC, you know, well, not just the MCMC part, to do a, a full Bayesian analysis with proper priors and proper sensitivity studies and, doing everything carefully and understanding everything about the statistical analysis you've done uh, is probably something that should also require large numbers of FTE years of people's time and effort and, and do a big job. We're, we're not doing that uh, in general. Uh, it's done you know, 
reasonably well, I think. And uh, is that having a big, it probably almost certainly means we're not, you know, absolutely mathematically maximizing our extraction of information from, from the data we have uh, obtained. But maybe that's not the right question. The right question might be, you know, are we being misled scientifically? Are we really coming to qualitative conclusions or, or quantitative ones for that matter that are wrong? Hard to say, I guess. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know. Uh, and you know the answer is probably not the same in every case, but uh, but really doing the statistics right would be a hard big job. Will be a hard big job. And not doing it right has some negative consequence that's hard to evaluate. Whether it's a, whether it's you know this is just like <coughs> niceties or um, it's probably worse when the data when you're trying to answer a question for which the data is marginal. If, if the data is really strong, if the Bayes factor is really huge, uh, then you know it's like chi-square fitting to uh, you know a, a nonlinear parameter. It's biased, but if you have enough data, the bias is tiny, and maybe you don't really care for the uh, for the answer. So maybe that's the case here. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> For the comments, questions. Anyone need antidepressants? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's I not. See, I, want yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to see your video. Uh, All right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't have it. You know, like right here where I can plug in and show it to you. But but we could. You know, I'll, I'll be here another three weeks. I could dig it up. And, uh, yeah, we could put it up. Yeah. Yeah, put it on the website or um, you know, show it a coffee or you know, like one of the weekly. Um, what's the thing called on Friday or something? You know, if yeah. you want to see it. But uh, it's it's pretty boring by modern you know, comparison. But you really need some Scott Joplin to get out of that to make it. Uh, Maybe Wednesday meeting is perfect. <laughs> Okay, let's let's thank Ed again for this wonderful stream. And thanks for the invitation. This sure. was fun. I, I, it was nice to pull together this yeah. presentation. Wow, sort of